Margaret Wu, I'll just remind you all that the Chinese New Year Parade, right, its largest annual Chinese festival, is set for 3 o'clock on Saturday, the 5th of February. So I hope we have a fine, warm winter day like today, and you can all join us for the parade beginning at <coughs> um, <coughs> the, the City Court building and then winding our way down to the Maywa Museum. Um, so we'll see you all there for the Year of the Tiger. <coughs> So my, my story today is a biography of a woman named Margaret Wu. <clears throat> and she is only tangentially connected to Butte, America by marriage. This is Margaret Wu's wedding photo from February 1945. And as we go from left to right across here, we see Lolita Wu, her aunt, Margaret Wu, <coughs> the bride, little Carol Wu, her niece, Howard Y. Chin, Howard Yen Chin of Butte, and his younger brother, Young Gi Chin, <coughs> uh, also uh, of Butte, of course. So Margaret Wu was born in China in 1912. Uh, died in Minneapolis, Minnesota in 1982. But as a young girl, she came to America and was raised in the United States. So the Wu family, much like the Chin family here in Butte, is a great story of Chinese-American transnationalism. They, they were people for a generation or two that literally had their feet in two worlds. Very unlike my Irish ancestors, you know, uh, my, my great grandfather and his brother came from Ireland at the age of 14 and 16, and they never looked back. Nothing that ever happened in Ireland, so far as they were concerned, <clears throat> enticed them to go back. It was an awful place. The British treated them horribly. Starvation was rampant. Work was scarce. And so they made a new life in America. And they weren't transnational at all. Once they got through the rigmarole of Ellis Island and, and found their way uh, to a place where they could work in the Pennsylvania coal mines, life was good. But for a lot of Chinese Americans, very different kind of story of emigration. It's a story of going back and forth to the mother country. So our, our character, Margaret Wu, is part of a Chinese family of some distinction. Um, so her, her auntie that you saw in that wedding photograph, Leon May Sing, um, shown here um, in a photograph with her uh, adopted child, um, and also in a photograph of um, the Westminster uh, Presbyterian Church Mission um, in Minneapolis, was an interesting and notable Chinese American in her own right. She had been born in China about 1871. Her family was so poor that they sold her into prostitution and she was shipped off to San Francisco in 1885. Thanks to a Presbyterian mission in San Francisco, she escaped the whorehouse in 1889 and in an arranged marriage, she married Wu Yi Sing, a Chinese immigrant in Minneapolis. Now, this indicates a couple things. Certainly the status of women in China during that period, pre-revolution, pre-China uh, <coughs> Republican Revolution of 1911, women were very low status in China, whether you were a wife or a daughter, but it also indicates how connected the Chinese-American community was, 
right? So that a guy living as a bachelor in Minneapolis would know about a Presbyterian mission in San Francisco that was saving these young prostitutes out of the whorehouse and arranging <coughs> marriages for them, right? Kind of a kind of a, a fantastic thing. <clears throat> so uh, Wu Yi Sing, her uh, Leon May Sing's husband, had come to Minneapolis as a young man um, <clears throat> about 1882, and like a lot of Chinese. He initially went to California, the West Coast, but Chinese racism and prejudice was so rampant by that time in California <clears throat> that the Chinese were not very welcome there. And so typically, many of the Chinese moved inland to Butte, Montana, where they were much more welcome than in California or Washington or Oregon, where you might be dragged out of your house, lynched, murdered, beaten, robbed, right? Same thing happened with the Chinese in Wyoming. Didn't happen in Butte, it didn't happen in Minneapolis, which is why <clears throat> Wu Yixing found his way there where he started initially a laundry and then a restaurant. <clears throat> and so you can get a, an idea of the transnationalism here with these two photographs of Liang Mei Xin and her new husband Wu Yixing um, on the left in their marriage photograph where they're still dressed in very traditional Chinese clothing. But these are people that know how to move about in both worlds and so on the right you see their honeymoon photo when they went to um, the great um, <coughs> Colombian um, exposition. Uh, and, and dressed in very contemporary uh, Western clothes for the time. Now, Wu Yi Sing was the next to the youngest of five brothers. And he was the first one to come to China, but he wasn't the last. So once he got his business going in Minneapolis, he sent for his younger brother. Reducing. And this is a very common thing with Chinese families during this time, that they, <clears throat> that all of the brothers will share a name and then they'll have another marker in their name that indicates what birthplace they were in the order. <clears throat> so, um, so Wu Yixing, the fourth of five brothers, <clears throat> sent for his younger brother, Wu Duxing, um, shown in this photograph. And Wu Duxing comes to Minneapolis about 1883, and he and his brother start the new Canton Cafe. <clears throat> uh, very successful um, establishment, and it goes on for many, many years um, in Minneapolis. Like a lot of Chinese during this period, Wu Duxing and his brother Wu Yi are traveling back and forth between Minneapolis and China. And so Wu Duxing <clears throat> goes back to China around uh, 1900 <clears throat> in an arranged family marriage. Uh, marries the woman that you see shown here on the right, Mar Shi, <clears throat> um, comes back to America. Um, Wu Duxing does, and then goes back to China again <clears throat> to bring his, his wife and the oldest boy, that's Charles standing in the back, and the new baby, <clears throat> uh, Margaret, um, in 1914. She's uh, less than two years old <clears throat> at, at that time. Um, so again, this emphasis on a transnational family. Now, why did the Chinese go back and forth so much? Well, partly it was family, right? So your connection to family is very, very important in China. So many of my Chinese students are part of Chinese families that keep log books in their ancestral house that go back typically 500 or so years, often 1,000 or more years, keeping track of all the male generations. Until after 1911, they didn't keep track of the women at all. Daughters aren't even mentioned in, in the birth records, but the sons are. 
Part of the reason, though, was also <coughs> business. Wu Yixing had been very prosperous, he and his brother shown here in Minneapolis, and they were using that money to invest in a lot of business ventures and properties that they were managing with some of their other brothers back in China. Now, the Canton Cafe in Minneapolis <clears throat> gets rebuilt at some point. Technically, in Chinese, it's called the Yuan Fang Lo <clears throat> uh, restaurant, or the place of many perspectives. Typically in Minneapolis, though, it was just known as John's Place. It was a very elegant, prosperous restaurant, as you might gather from the photograph around 1970, right, and the decor shown here. It was far fancier than any Chinese restaurant in Butte. Um, the Peking Noodle Parlor um, that you all know today was, was considered, you know, pretty, pretty high class as uh, Chinese restaurants in Butte. And the Meiwan Noodle Parlor was probably considered the, the best or the fanciest restaurant, Chinese restaurant in Butte. Um, but John's Place was still um, a cut above that. The two brothers worked very closely together in managing this business. So the older brother, Wu Yixing, he was the front man. He was the one who dealt with the English-speaking community. He dealt with the customers, right, that might be coming in. Wu Du Sing, on the other hand, he was the inside man. He dealt with the Chinese staff and the cooks, and also with the suppliers of Chinese foodstuffs and merchandise that was being imported from, from China. So the brothers worked very closely together on that. Um, here's a, uh, a menu, not certain when, probably from the 1930s of the Yuan Fong Ro, John's Place um, in Minneapolis. Um, and again, pretty nice, kind of a, kind of a fancy uh, menu. Um, the gate is very symbolic for Chinese. And so a gate is <clears throat> uh, very important if you're entering your own home or if you're entering a business or as some of you know, maybe if you've been to, you know, say Chinatowns in Seattle um, or San Francisco or other cities, they're often the main entrance to Chinatown is marked by a <coughs> gate. Right? Very important to have that sense of passage. A little bit like our gate at Montana Tech right now when you come up Park Street, right? <clears throat> as, as demarcating that boundary. Well, Wu Du Sing's family fell on some, uh, oops, what happened here? Uh, my, my slideshow just jumped ahead for some reason. Uh, okay. So, um, when we found out about the Margaret Wu story through some of the Qin descendants here in Butte, it was an interesting story, but not something that, as an historian, I would have wanted to write or research about. But then we kept learning more. We were donated here at the Meiwa Museum in Butte a collection of dresses that Margaret had had made for herself while she lived in China from 1935 to 1937. And then we found out she had kept a diary during this experience. So all the, the sort of historical senses, right, were, were sort of turning on for me that this was not only a good story to tell, but a story that we had um, a good archival record that we could tap into to tell. So Margaret Wu starts keeping this diary in 1935, so she's about 22 years old or so, before her departure to China. Um, she writes on uh, Tuesday, October 1st, 1935, left Minneapolis at 9.20 a.m. Is it goodbye? Now, she means that partly because is this goodbye to America or to my home in Minneapolis, but she's also had a boyfriend. And she's very concerned. 
right, about what this separ separation means <coughs> for her and her boyfriend. On the sea voyage, it's some good, some bad. <clears throat> when they stop at Honolulu and leave Honolulu in October 11, 1935, the sea was rough. And she writes, no lunch. First time I had to feed the fish. Right? For those of you right, who have been out uh, on the ocean and gotten seasick, right? <clears throat> Um, you, you have some sense of this. But then she has ice cream for dinner, so things can't be too bad, right? And she says, full moon, am I homesick? Um, and here's a, a photograph of her with her uh, younger cousin, Roger, uh, at that stop in, in Hawaii. So she certainly has a lot of misgivings um, about leaving America, but she doesn't have a choice about it. It's absolutely necessary. Sadly, her father had died in 1934, late in the year. And her mother, Marshi, had simply never assimilated into American life. Hardly knew any English, didn't like going out of the house. She was a very traditional kind of old school Chinese woman. Also, Wu Du Sing, like many Chinese in America, had built a place in China, planning for his retirement. He never planned, unlike many other Chinese Americans, he didn't plan to stay in America. He had planned to sort of make, make his name here, earn some wealth, invest in things in China, build a home back in the home village in China, and then move back. He never got to do that. And so Marshi, the wife, returns with the kids on his voyage in 1935. And along with that, they have in a copper coffin, Wu Du Sing's body that has to be buried back in China. That's part of the tradition. The Chinese say, fallen leaves return to the roots. And when you die, right, you have to go back um, to that home tree. As an historian, I've got a lot of questions about that voyage that we're never going to be able to answer because they, they didn't come and go through America. And in fact, earlier trips that Wu Du Sing made to China, he didn't come and go through America either. They would go across the Canadian border and depart and arrive from Vancouver, Canada. I think that was to get around the 1882 Immigration Act that put all kinds of serious restrictions on the travel of Chinese Americans. So it's like Margaret, because she had been born in China, even though she moves to America as a two-year-old chi child, the 1882 Immigration Act forbid her from ever becoming an American citizen, right? So that's part of what fed this transnationalism and the idea for people like Wu Du Sing um, to have a house back in China that they could go to. Well, when Margaret gets to China, she is not impressed. She writes uh, in her diary on October 22nd, beggars, rickshaw drivers, wharf coolies, dirty women and children. So this is Shanghai, the cosmopolitan city. The noise of cars and horns and human beings frighten me. The odors are nauseating. But then later in the day, met the men at the Metropole. Shanghai's newest cabaret, very beautifully decorated both sides, inside with beautiful dance girls resplendent in Shanghai gowns. So Margaret's a small city girl, right? Grew up in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. You know, for her mother, or even for her older brother, who had been with the father who brought back and forth to China previously, you know, China was China. But for Margaret, um, it was very, very kind of shocking and not so easy as it was <clears throat> for her brothers. It gets even harder. So 
Almost all of the Chinese immigrants who came to America in the 19th century were from a very small part of China. Now, China as a nation is about the same size as the United States. But almost all of the 300,000 Chinese who come to America before 1900 come from a very small region called the Pearl River Delta around the present day city of Guangzhou, the historical city of Canton. <clears throat> Why did all the Chinese come from there, not other parts of China? Well, for centuries, this had been the only port of trade in China that was open to the West. The Chinese imperial government, the Qing Dynasty, had been very suspicious of trade with outsiders. So they limited that to a single port city in Canton. And so the people in Canton were, in a sense, world citizens. They knew about what was going on in the rest of the world. And when the gold strikes occurred in 1848, 1849 in California, people in the Pearl River Delta knew about it as sooner, sooner than most people living in the eastern United States knew about it. And they were the first to get there. They got to California before many Eastern Americans sailing all the way down around right, the Horn of South America could get to the California gold fields. <clears throat> so, so that's part, part of it. So in this Pearl River Delta area, the 1882 Exclusion Act had tried to stop that immigration, but still for families like the, Sin, the Wu family and the Qin family here in Butte, they went back and forth um, a lot and practiced chain migration, bringing family members over, right, marrying women in China, bringing their wives and kids over <clears throat> um, as well. Now, Canton was a pretty big, busy city during this period when Margaret Wu goes there, <clears throat> 1935. But as soon as you get out of the city, <clears throat> so the city of Canton is shown in that first circle, and in the lower circle, her home village in Kaiping <clears throat> is shown. So even though <clears throat> you know it's only 40 or 50 miles, it is a night and day difference. You are in the Chinese peasant culture when you're out of a big Chinese city, <clears throat> and Margaret didn't like it. Now, that Chinese culture in the Pearl River Delta was driven by all of this wealth from transnational Chinese, from Chinese in America, in Canada, in South America, in Europe, in other Asian countries, and all of these Chinese families around the world were feeding wealth back to the five counties or the Pearl River Delta region. And they were building these big fancy houses, like the Ma Xiang Long Towers that you see on the left, or the whole Chikan village, built primarily by Canadian Chinese uh, <clears throat> in the 1930s. And interesting differences. The towers were built at an earlier period, around 1912, 1914, shortly after the founding of the Chinese Republic, and those are defensive towers. They originally had gun ports up on the top to defend themselves <clears throat> um, from the raiding bands of, of Chinese criminals. <clears throat> um, but by the 1920s, 1930s, China is much more politically stable and lots of undefended villages like Chikan showing up. And there are thousands of these called Lu mansions or Chinese transnational mansions across the Chinese countryside in that region. So here is the Wudu Sing House, built in 1935 as one of two twin houses with one of his older brothers in China. And <clears throat> the story that we got, my uh, co-researcher, Shawa Chen Brazil, 
who had been a Chinese American immigrant uh, naturalized graduate student <coughs> at Montana Tech. She now <coughs> is teaching and working at MSU. We interviewed local people and they said, you know, the copper coffin is still in that house. <laughs> that they had started out to bury it, but the, some of the local bandits were threatening to dig it up to salvage the copper, so they unearthed it from the original grave, buried it in the basement. We never got to figure out if that was true. It was also known as the Red Brick House. Unlike most of these Chinese villages, uh, houses built by Chinese Americans, <clears throat> this house was not built with native Chinese brick. This was built with red brick, possibly imported from the United States, probably imported from England. Uh, China didn't make red brick <clears throat> during this time. So we had heard about this house from the family, the red brick house. They had given us this historical photograph and it was only one of a large number of family properties that the Wu family owned. Well, we wanted to find this house, and we didn't have anything, only the very sketchiest information about where it might be. So this starts out a real quest. <coughs> Luckily, my co-author, um, Shahua Chen, Brazil, she's married to a, a guy from Whitehall, She's fluent not just in Chinese, but also in local Cantonese and a lot of the local dialects. She grew up in this area. So we start interviewing people, trying to track this down. I'm at Sumyat Sun University teaching um, an exchange course there. That's a partner university with Montana Tech. A geology professor takes an interest because he grew up out in this region. And so he gets a van and some of his graduate students to assist us on our travels around the countryside trying to track down this house. We make a couple of false starts because it turns out while red brick houses are pretty rare, that's not the only one. So, so we arrive at a couple other red brick houses and say, this doesn't look like the photograph. <clears throat> But then we find the house. And so you see the front gate to the two houses on the left, and then the two houses on the right uh, photo. And so we found the house partly by a lucky connection. One of the local villagers that proved to be a dead end said, you should go to the local university. There's a professor there who documents these overseas houses. So we went and visited him, got some sort of rough directions to this place. Then, thanks to Shawa and my geology professor friends, language skills, you know, we kept stopping, you know, knocking on doors, waving to peasants, you know, working out in a field with our ox, <clears throat> and we found, <clears throat> uh, we found the house. Um, we also found a number of the other Wu family properties. They own uh, 11 business properties that we could find in the city of Guangzhou. And you'll note that these houses are boarded up. That's because the ownership title is not clear, and so the Chinese government has sealed them. And one of the problems is the American side of the family has heirs who own an interest in this house, but because of their bitterness toward what happened in China after 1949 and the communist takeover, they want nothing to do with it. So even though they've been contacted several times by the Chinese government about these houses and about these 11 business properties, potentially worth millions of dollars, they said, we. We have our life here in America. We don't want anything to do with it. <laughs> right? Very interesting kind of, kind of, of situation. <clears throat> so this is where Margaret's living in 1935. <coughs> Seems like a nice house, but she is not impressed. <clears throat> 
In January 1936, she writes, stayed in the house and tried to talk to Ma about going back, back to Minneapolis. She asked me what was there for me over there and what is there, right? Her boyfriend isn't writing letters back to her, right? So she, she's, she's kind of heartbroken about that. The next day she writes, it's up to me to go to school. No matter how much I wanted to tell Ma about the boyfriend and going back to America, I just couldn't. <clears throat> now, the, the quotation at the top, I'm, and, and actually the full quotation is, I'm not having none of that, double negative. <clears throat> Margaret recalls later in her life, that was her response because her mother wanted to marry her off to a local village boy. Margaret isn't even fluent in Chinese. She can speak basic Cantonese with her mom, but she hasn't been educated in, in Chinese. She certainly doesn't feel at home in the culture. So to avoid being married off to a local village guy, she finds out about Lingnan University, as shown in the campus uh, building here from uh, a 1945 <coughs> photograph. And she gets out of the village, enrolls at Lingnan University to escape that village life. Lingnan University is a pretty happening place during this period. It had been established in 1888 in China by the Presbyterian Church as a Christian college, but then became an independent Chinese college in 1927. And once there, Margaret likes it. It's lots of fun. She doesn't write much about her classes in her diary. She writes, went to my first dance with Bill. We don't know who Bill is. Lots of fun. Danced from 9 to 2.30. I take it that's 2.30 in the morning. And I'm all tired. Got back to Brownell, that's her dormitory, at 3.16. I take it that's a.m. What a relief to get in bed. A week later, went to Marion Lockwood's party. Marion is one of the professors at the school. Danced at Mrs. Padgett's home, another professor. Boys are crazy about my dress. <clears throat> So Lingnan University, very progressive. It had become a co-educational <coughs> uh, college in 1903, even before the Chinese Revolution. It was by the time Margaret was there, a very international school. About 300 faculty members, 30 of whom were foreign faculty members, like <coughs> Mrs. Lockwood and Mrs. Padgett. Uh, referred to here. Um, also five female faculty members. Um, when Margaret was there, about 200 female students, some from China, some from Hong Kong, which of course was a British colony during that time, many more from the United States and Canada, including Moi Hum from Butte, Montana, part of the Hum family that had the Peking restaurant. <clears throat> <clears throat> Happiness soon comes to an end. In July 7th, Margaret writes this very cryptic entry into her diary. Got pictures. Why the public ad? So what is she talking about, right? What's this public ad? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> the Japanese were invading China. This is, for China, the beginning of World War II. So an Associated Press photograph here, July 8, 1937, the Chinese army defending Beijing <clears throat> from the Japanese uh, attackers, which of course quickly overrun the Chinese lines and progressively begin invading <clears throat> and conquering China as a Japanese colony. <clears throat> Margaret is very apolitical. She's not anti-political. She just doesn't pay any attention to it, right? She's more 
fun going to parties and dancing and getting new, new dresses at this time in her life. But she certainly starts paying attention by September of 1937 when the Japanese start aerial bombardment of Canton and other southern Japanese cities. Classes are suspended in October of 1937, and Margaret is a Chinese citizen. And so if she's trapped in China, especially at a woman at a progressive university, that's going to be trouble. She's probably going to end up in a Japanese internment camp. And we know what the Japanese do to young women, right? Ask the Koreans asked the northern Chinese, who had already by this time been conquered by the Japanese, right? They're turned into <clears throat> um, prostitutes for the, the Japanese officers, right? So she, she certainly knows this very well. So she gets out of <clears throat> uh, China to Hong Kong just as the bridge behind her is taken by the Japanese, right? She, she, she cuts it pretty close. Flees, uh, flees back to America. Probably, we don't know this for sure, but probably with another Chinese American student that she's become friends with. She doesn't write about that in the diary. She's probably pretty traumatized. Goes back to um, <clears throat> Milwaukee, lives with Auntie May that you saw uh, earlier <clears throat> um, in the wedding photo. And she's a cashier at John's place, and she takes classes at the local community college. Meanwhile, <clears throat> parallel lives, right? In Butte, Montana, we should write a movie script about this, right? <clears throat> we have the Chin family. Right? Down at the Maywa Noodle Parlor and the Wachong Thai Mercantile. And the family photograph shown here, Albert Chin and his wife, <coughs> Liu Fong Lun, um, with their nine kids, one of whom is adopted from China on one of those back and forth trips. Liu Fong Lun um, adopted her sister's child because her sister's husband had died. And in China, if your father dies, you're an orphan, right? Again, the, the status of women in Chinese society during that time. So, but no problem for the Qin family. They adopt um, the daughter and just raise her as one of their own nine, uh, their own nine kids. Um, Howard is uh, in the back row, uh, second from, or no, the first, <coughs> first from the left because he's the uh, second, <coughs> second oldest <coughs> uh, brother. <coughs> so the Chin family, much like the Wu family in Minneapolis, had found prosperity in America. Between the noodle parlor restaurant and the mercantile, things had been pretty good, even through the dark days of the Depression. The mines were working. A lot of the single young miners, men, needed a place to eat, right? They typically stayed in boarding houses, took their meals out, right? So they ate at the Mewa Noodle Parlor along with um, a lot of other people. And everyone in Butte, it seemed, seemed to shop at the La Chong Thai Mercantile. It wasn't just for the Asian community by, by any means. <clears throat> but, the war in China, right, from the late 1930s, comes to America, December 7th, 1941. And of course, the United States immediately declares war <coughs> on Japan, becomes an ally of China, <coughs> and things change drastically for Chinese Americans and for the Qin family in particular. So for, for Chinese Americans, even if, like the Chin family and the younger boys of the Chin family, they have no intention of ever moving back to China to live there, they are very patriotic when China has been attacked by the Japanese. 
and uh, many are taken into the armed forces. The story we get from the family is that three of the Chin boys enlisted. Um, Howard did not because he was sort of angry with the American government over a drug raid that his father had been rolled up in in connection with narcotic smuggling with Lucky Luciano, the Italian mafia gang, right? So Chinese and mafia, right, working together. He was a little angry at the American government. Uh, but nevertheless, um, he, he gets uh, drafted, and Howard goes to Fort Snelling. And Fort Snelling is just outside of Minneapolis. And it is the facility for language. <clears throat> Uh, foreign language and especially um, Japanese language for the American <coughs> Army. The American Army sets up the military intelligence language school there. Howard is part of that. He has a great uh, facility for learning Japanese. Now the location of Fort Snelling, um, for any of you that are, are wherever like radio amateur operators or understand shortwave, shortwave radio skips with the Earth's atmosphere. Minneapolis happened to be located at a location where the Japanese radio signals would skip off the ionosphere and back down to the surface of the Earth. So the language school was set up there to intercept and to translate and decode Japanese uh, messages. Um, so, so Howard uh, gets educated uh, there and meets a lot of other uh, Chinese and uh, Japanese Americans who have enlisted or been drafted um, and who are also part of that army unit. And the Chinese students where do they go, or the Chinese soldiers, where do they go on a Friday night or a Saturday night? They go into Minneapolis and they go to John's place. <clears throat> and so it becomes a joke within the Wu family. Hmm, is Howard here for the egg Fu Young or to see Margaret? He's there to see Margaret. <clears throat> so before the Wu's will even consent right, to a marriage, they check out Howard's background. This is easily possible again because within America, the Chinese form a very closely connected community. So even though the Wu's don't directly know the Chins in Butte, there's lots of go-betweens right, to find information. Who is this boy? Oh, his father got arrested for narcotics. We don't know, but he's working and he runs the business, right, at the Maywa Noodle Parlor, right? He's a hard-working boy. He did well in, at Butte High School. They assent to <coughs> the marriage. And so here we are again. So Howard, after his language school uh, experience, uh, marries Margaret. He gets sent back to China then um, to do translation services with the American army there. And while he's chi in China, he locates the house, the red brick house, and he makes sure that um, Charles and the younger brother that stayed behind in China are okay, right? <clears throat> and so he's pretty solid with the Wu family, right, by, <clears throat> by his ability to do that. And then he, he facilitates their um, <clears throat> immigration back to the United States after 1946, right? So the family is eventually all back together and the rest, as they say, is history. So that's the story of Margaret Wu. Um, what questions do you have?